We thank you for joining us this uh, Sunday morning, especially on Mother's Day. And um, we pray that this service would be a blessing to you. If you have your Bible or electronic device, I would love to draw your attention to uh, the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, chapter number 7. I will begin at, begin at verse number 1 and read all the way through verse number 14. I will read chapter 7, verse 1 through verse number 14. Amen. So if you have it, I'm going to go ahead and uh, begin uh, to read that. And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that reason the king of Syria and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up toward Jerusalem against it. But... If I had a whole congregation, I would say, let's say, but, but could not prevail against it. They went up, but they could not prevail against it. I want to let you know that the weapons against you shall not prosper. They shall not prevail. Verse number two, and it was told the house of David, saying, Syria is confederate with Ephraim. And his heart was moved and the heart of his people. As the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. Verse number three, then said the Lord unto Isaiah, go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and Shirajashub, uh, thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the fullest field, and say unto him, Take heed and be quiet, fear not, neither be faint-hearted, for the two tails of the smoking firebrands. Don't fear. Don't become faint-hearted. Just be quiet, be still. For the fierce anger of reason with Syria and of the son of Remaliah, because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have taken evil counsel against thee, saying, Let us go up against Judah and vex it, and let us make a breach therein for us and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabal. Or to build. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall not stand. Regardless of what they set up against you, regardless of who's with him, regardless of what seems to be on their side, regardless of the forces that are set against them, the Lord God said, it shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. For the head of Syria, and this is the reason why it's not going to stand, because who their head was, said, for the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is reason. And within threescore and five years shall Ephraim be broken, that it be not a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Remaliah's son. I want to let you know that this shall not come to pass. It shall not happen. Don't be faint-hearted. Don't get fearful. Stand still. Be quiet. I'm letting you know everything that's stacked up against you. Hey, I'm going to take care of the Lord of Sam. Verse number nine again, talking about the heads, and then he goes on and says, If ye will not believe, surely ye shall not be established. In other words, you have to believe that God's intent for you and God's ending for you 
God's ending expectation, what God is designed to do, all things working together for good, you must believe. If you do not believe, it won't be established in your life. You cannot live by negative faith. You can't live by Murphy's Law. You can't live in the concepts of this world looking for the next shoe to fall. You can't look for the next work rug to be swept up from under your feet. You must look and have high expectations that God is on your side. And, and it doesn't matter who's with them. It doesn't matter because their heads or who he proclaimed them to be. In other words, the reason why it won't come to pass is because of who their head is. And as long as you know who your head is, you're going to be okay. Verse number 10. Moreover, the Lord spake again the second time, Spoke again to unto Ahaz, obviously through the prophet Isaiah. Spoke again unto the king Ahaz, the king of Judah, the tribe of David, saying, ask thee a sign. This is what I want you to do. The Lord is telling him, ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth, meaning I want you to ask a sign so deep just to prove that I'm going to do what I said I would do. Deep as you can think, deep, deep as you can imagine, I want you to think of a deep sign. Imagine that thing. And he goes on and says, or in the height above. I want you to ask something that's high that only God can do, only the Lord can fulfill. Whether it's in the depth or in the height, I want you to ask for a sign of me. That's powerful. But Ahaz said, now, I mean, when God asks you, hey, ask of me a sign. I, just, just tell me to show you a sign that I am going to fulfill this. I am going to do this. And, and Ahab looked like he had some, uh, I guess, humility. He says, uh, he said, but Ahab said, I will not, not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. I won't test God, in other words. I'm not going to ask a sign. I'm, I'm not going to put God to the test, he said. And he said, how ye... I mean, hear ye now, O house of David. Now, this is the prophet again speaking in verse number 13. And here, and he said, hear ye now, O house of David. Isaiah is speaking again. Is it a small thing for you to weary men? But will you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. You didn't want to ask for a sign that God was going to do this thing. You didn't ask for a sign. You don't want to ask for a sign that God is going to confirm his word. You don't want to look and ask for a sign that God is faithful, that everything that's stacked up against you will not prosper. If you don't want to ask for a sign that, that will prove God's hand in everything that's going on, you don't want to do that. God himself will show you a sign. Behold, here's the sign. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And after that, I can imagine the prophet dropped the mic and he walked out. That was a drop the mic moment. And so we pick up in Matthew chapter number 1, verse 23, and 23, Matthew quoting from Isaiah chapter 7 to 14. And uh, the scripture says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel. And Matthew added, 
uh, to what Isaiah said. Now he's given the interpretation of Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. This whole prophecy about God himself showing his people, the house of David, a sign that he is faithful and that he's with them through difficult times, even though things and the enemy were stacked up against them, even though they were about to be invaded by the enemy, even though even Ephraim, which was a part of Israel, was set up against them. Everything seemed as though that they were on the wrong side and, 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 and all those things. So what transpired is God said, hey, Ask of me a sign. I'm going to show you what I'm going to do. I'm going to prove it to you in the sign. And they said, hey, no, I'm not going to tempt the Lord that way. So God says, I tell you, I'm going to give a sign on my own. I'm going to prove you what I'm going to do. I, I just ask you, ask for a sign that's either so deep that only I can do it or so high that only I can do it. And you didn't want to do that. So I'm, I myself, I'm going to show you a sign. I'm going to show you a deep sign. I'm going to show you a sign that only God can do. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. A woman is going to conceive a, a child, but she's going to be a virgin while she does it. And not only is she going to conceive this child, amen, but it is going to be called Emmanuel, which is God with us. I would like to title this message, if you will, Where's Your Head? Where's Your Head? Have anybody ever, you ever heard of that statement? Where's your head? And all this, excuse me, I got to pop this thing loose up again. <laughs> it was bothering me. I was thinking about it. It was bothering me. I want to preach to you this morning, where's your head? I, I want to know as so we take a, a side, where is your head in all this? In this coronavirus, all masked up, where, where is your head? And you know how when you, you, you know, sometimes my, my, my wife is talking to me or my kids or somebody's talking to me, and my head is a million miles away. I'm, I'm thinking about this, and, and that just to be quite frank, she's like that sometimes too. I'm like, you're not even listening to me. I'll say something crazy just to see if she's listening. But sometimes our, excuse the, the ad, our, our head is not in the game. You ever heard that statement? Get your head in the game, man. That sometimes we just, we just, our head is not in it. We're like, where's your head? Because you, you can't give it your all because your head is not in it. So I got a question for you, and it's a pun, obviously. Where, where's your head in all this? I'm talking about your head. What, what, what is your thinking like? Amen. Did, have you completely checked out? Amen. Have you turned off the noggin? <laughs> have you turned off the switch, and you're just kind of cruising on until this thing blows away? Uh, are you just kind of going through the motions, amen, until things can get back to normalcy? Amen. Have you, have you put it in cruise control, waiting, amen, to, to switch the gears? So where is your head? Now, now that I've done with the pun, I, I got a question for you. While we're going through this difficult time, I, I want to remind you of where your head is. I'm talking about the head of the body of Christ. You see, the reason why God told them not to fear the enemy and not to fear the things that were stock, stacked up, not to fear reason and not to fear Damascus because of the head, because of those that were with them, don't you be concerned, just be quiet. Don't get fearful. Don't get faint-hearted. And everything that's transpiring, and everything that's going on in your world and the things that are about to happen, 
Don't you know that they were, the enemy were stacked up against him? There wasn't an arrow that, that was shot at that particular time. There wasn't a sword that was drawn at that particular time. No one had died at that time. It was just that the enemy began to mount up his troops. It began to uh, begin its uh, assault. And before it began its assault, the children of, of David, the, the house of David, began to get fearful. The king began to get concerned at all the things that were stacked against him, at the weapons, amen, that were aiming towards him. But we need to understand and believe that these weapons that are formed against us, everything that's happening now and everything that is planned for the shortcoming and the, 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 the not-so-distant future, I'm here to tell you, it doesn't matter how bad things get. We need to remember who our head is and where our head is. We need to make sure we keep our head in the game. So he said, hey, I want you to do this. I, I want you to ask of a, a sign. I want you to ask the Lord. I, I, I'm, hey, if God asks me, sometimes you know how it is. God, give me a sign. Especially in my early Christian walk, amen, I was asking for signs every, every five minutes. God, give me a sign. And this is, you know, when you don't know how the voice of God, you're trying to find his will and everything else. You know, I'm praying, God, give me a sign. And this is, give me a sign for that. I, I got to the place, amen, I was, I, I, I was like the King Ahaz, man. I wasn't asking God for any more signs. So uh, quite frankly, I don't ask for signs anymore. So God is, he's in the position, God, if you want to do like you did here in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, you show a sign if you want to do that. You show a sign. And God said, hey, I'm going to oblige you. You don't want to ask for a sign? I'm going to show you a sign. What was the sign all about? It was about God showing that he was with them. The whole idea was for the house of David to know for a surety, to know without uh, a doubt in their mind that, or to, to know that God was with them. It didn't matter how bad things was. It didn't matter how bad things would get. It did, didn't matter, amen, whether there was food in the cabinet or not. It didn't matter what, whether they had shoes on their feet or not. It did not matter. God was with them. Can I tell you, God is with you even in the worst conditions and the worst circumstances? I want to remind, again, I want to remind someone. I want to remind us. Because I, I believe sometimes we forget. I, I, now, I know we try to act all uh, uh, spiritual and super righteous and everything else when we're in front of everybody else. Bless God. Uh, I trust him. And, you know, God is good and God is faithful. But I know what it's like when you're in your apartment and you're in your home and everything else. I know when things aren't going well. I know the griping and the complaining. I know the wondering and the question. I know wondering whether how things are going to come out. I, I know sometimes we don't, we can't see uh, the, the, uh, the end of the tunnel. We can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Sometimes we're wondering and everything. I know sometimes we're fearful. We're in our homes and, and, and we're afraid sometimes to even come outside of our door wondering if this uh, coronavirus is going to just jump on us out of nowhere like the coronavirus is hiding in the bushes waiting for us to come outside. <laughs> amen. Ready to attack us. Or the enemy, amen, is, is ready to, 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 to attack us. I'm going to tell you, like, I believe that things that are formed against us will not and cannot prosper. So God said, hey, I want to show you a sign that I had your best interest at heart. I want to prove to you that, amen, you are going to be okay, that everything is going to be all right, that... The whole world is in the palm of his hand. You can walk down the street with your head held up high. You can be encouraged in the Lord. Amen. You can be the light that God asks you to be in this dark world. Not because of who we are, what we have, other than the fact of who our head is. 
He said, hey, I'm going to tell you why it's not going to happen because of who their head is. And as long as you know who your head is and where your head is. And the problem was that the house of David did not know where their head was. The house of David did not understand that the head was with them. And so they were fearful. They were frightened. They were terrified at the circumstances that were surrounding them because they weren't looking at the fact that the head was with them. And so when God said, I want you to ask for a sign, and they could not uh, uh, ask God for that sign, God was saying, this is the greatest sign that you will need. And it's Emmanuel, which is being in interpret it, God is with you. The only sign you need is the very fact that God is with you. Hey, when everything is going wonderful and things is going as works as it can get, God is always with you. That's the only sign you need. Church, can I tell you, church of the living God, that's the only sign we need in this adulterous generation. That's the only sign we need in this dark world. Amen. I know things are getting bad. I know things are getting rough. I know opposition is against us. Amen. I know we're like a sore thumb that sticks out in this world. But we need to keep on keeping on. Maintain our walk. Keep our identity. Maintain and keep our hold of our doctrine. Live like we should live. Be the people of God because regardless of how many are stacked against us, God is with us. This is the sign you need. God with us. God with us. Emmanuel. I uh began to mull over something that was communicated to me uh, in my uh, times of pastoring people. I uh, have found that in the good times, there are people that I pastor that they are elated, elevated, riding high. Everything is wonderful. They're on the top of the roller coaster ride. Their hands are lifted high. Like the, yes, let's, let's do this thing. And then, all of a sudden, there's a downward drop. And what used to be and what was hands lifted high and smiles, now they are grabbing something, eyes are closed, teeth grinding together, and they're holding on for dear life. Uh, and their stomach, their hearts drop to their stomach, and amen, they just don't know what's going to happen. And all they can say is, take me off this crazy ride. Got to get off this thing. I don't know what's going to happen. I had a, 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 a text or an email of uh, the blessings of God upon a particular individual's life. And God was truly blessing. God was doing things outside of the norm. And, and, and uh, just to, if in my interpretation and opinion, to give them a sign that God was with them. And, uh, and I love when God does that. I love when God moves unexpectedly and, and he, he begins to operate and do things 
that's not on the normal schedule of things. And out of nowhere, out of the clear blue, something transpires uh, where God is working on my behalf and, and working for my interest. And I give credit to God because every good gift and every perfect gift come up down from the Father of lights. Amen. Anything you get, you ought to give God praise. Everything you get, you ought to thank him. I don't care who he uses as the giver. Amen. The Bible says give and it shall be given unto you. We need to understand the concept of giving. You see, that's why I'm talking about random acts of kindness. You don't give to get, amen. You give because of who you are. And the more we give, the more we give of ourselves, God begins to give back to you because you can't outgive God. And I find that people who complain about not having, that's because they're takers and they're not givers. And I'm getting off the subject of God being with us, but I want to identify, amen, you need to stop complaining about what you don't have and to begin to give of what you do have. And when you live a constant life of being a giver and not a taker, amen, God begins to give to you. That particular scripture says it like this. Give, and men shall give unto your bosom. And so I'm not surprised at the fact of, of, of neighbors coming to give me something. I'm not surprised that I, I looked in my mailbox one day and there was $200 in it. I still don't know today who put $200 bills in my mailbox. I, I don't know who did it. They didn't give a name and maybe it's you. Hey, praise God. Thank you. Hey, don't try to take the credit for it. God must have put it in your heart. I don't care how you did it. I'm not surprised. When I, 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 you know what? I've come to the, to, to, to the conclusion that I, I need to stop being a certain way. So I'm letting you know today, because you all are talking about, Pastor, you're a hard person to give. I guess give something to. The Lord rebuked me. Just last week, the Lord rebuked me. Somebody wanted to be a blessing to me, and I, I, it, was, it was actually a, 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 a preacher. It was a bishop. And one of my, uh, you know, uh, friends uh, that I communicate with and and uh, and uh, I'm like, I don't want this. I don't, you know, whatever. And and uh, and the Lord rebuked me. And the spirit of the Lord, when I say, uh -uh, I don't, I'm not, not, I don't want it. And the Lord said to these words, those who I want to use to bless you. You don't. Uh, reject and refuse my blessings. And I'm like, okay. So I told my wife, because I was telling her, I'm not, and she, you know, she was the same, and the Lord did the same thing to her. Because uh, it's just people who give, they have a hard time receiving it sometimes. And some of you are like that. And, uh, I, 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 and I know I'm off the subject, I'm getting back to it, but I, I realize, I've come to the conclusion, I'm going to stop doing that. See, my problem is I don't want people to give to me for two reasons as a pastor. I don't want people to think when they give to me that I owe them something, and I don't want people to try to buy me. Because I need to pastor people and not worry about what you just did for me when I need to deal with something. Because if you give me something and then I had to get ugly. <laughs> You're like, wow, I just gave them something. No. I didn't take it so I can get ugly. And what I mean by getting ugly, I mean where you had to be a pastor. Pastor, get those, those, the staff, you know that hook, you know what that hook is for? That hook is to get a hold of your neck if I need to. Or the legs or whatever. And so that's the, that rod in our staff. And so that's one reason why I don't accept things from a lot of times from the church members. And the second reason why is I don't want people to feel like they're giving to, you know, I, I like to be the giver. But the Lord took care of that. So, and my wife and them tell me, you're so difficult. So for now and on, I'm just going to receive whatever. If God uses, because that's what the scripture said, men shall men give into your bosom. I, I'm going to stop that. So when somebody give, I'm not going to do that any longer. So I, I've been delivered. I've been set free. But let me tell you something. Let me tell you something right now. 
God uses that. But again, this particular person, I, they were sending me something that shown what they what out of nowhere, someone just gave and then someone else did something else. And it was like, man, I, and I, I was like, see, that's the blessings of God in your life. I don't care who did this, that, and the other. That's the blessing. God is showing you that's the blessing of God. And, that, and they're like, yeah, I praise it. But you know what I did? I felt a teaching moment. And I said, you need to remember this. When things aren't going like you think they should go. Amen. When things look so negative, because the same God that blesses you when things are going well, it's the same God that blesses you when things aren't going well. You got to remember that's the same God. You see, God is with you in the blessings and God is with you when you're going through. Hey, it takes a person of faith to see and realize when God is with you in the pit. Everybody can praise when they're sitting on the throne. Amen. When people are bowing down before them and when people are bringing gifts to them. But it's another thing altogether when people are looking down on you. Amen. When things are not going well, when they take off your coat of many colors, when people are accusing you or you're thrown in a prison, can you still believe that God is still with you? I'm going to show you a sign. What sign did Joseph have after being thrown in the pit? What sign did he have when he was in chains being carried away by the Israelites down to Egypt? What sign did he have? that he was still going to be that person that would have his kindred bow before him. There was nothing, it seemed, within the cause. There was no sign uh, within the picture. There was nothing that was given to indicate to anyone that the dreams and the end of the thing that Joseph dreamed would come to pass. It seemed like it was just a mere dream. It seems as though it was a mere thought. Maybe he got it from his own ambition. Maybe he got it from his own selfishness. Maybe Maybe it wasn't a dream from God after all. It doesn't say anything about Joseph receiving anything. Any confirmations. You know how we want a confirmation. And then God gives a confirmation. We want a confirmation for the confirmation. And then we want a confirmation for the confirmation for the confirmation. I remember when I felt called to preach and I'm like, God, give me a confirmation. God will send a confirmation. I said, okay, give me a confirmation, not a confirmation. Amen. Hey, I want the fleece to be white, uh, uh, wet on, and the ground dry, and I want the, uh, I want the ground wet and the fleece dry. Amen. I, I want to do all those things, and you know, y'all know what I'm talking about. And God says, "Hey, you, you don't need all those signs. What sign did Joseph have? I, I want to bring this to your attention. So, hopefully, you have a few minutes." <laughs> We're not having an evening service, so I don't feel compelled to rush it along, but I won't be too much longer. Amen. Uh, I I heard this joke once. Actually, I don't don't know how many times she was married, but obviously it was a lot lot of times. I think Liz Liz Taylor, well, she married Elizabeth Taylor, married a lot of times, like six, seven, eight. Uh, Dolly Parton. One of them, somebody going to look it up. But I think Elizabeth Taylor is like married like a lot of times. And I believe that was a person. And, and, and uh, so, <laughs> so, I, uh, so she, she married the next guy and, and she, she made the statement, don't worry, I won't keep you long. <laughs> so that, I, I'm going to be like Elizabeth Taylor. Don't worry, I won't keep you much longer. <laughs> get you out of here uh, or off the set so you can enjoy your mother's day. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Uh, forgive me for that carnal uh, analogy. It was just a little uh, joke to try to lighten the moment. Amen. You know when a preacher does a little joke, he, next thing you know, he's going to come with something like, oh! You know how the doctor tried to distract you and then he tried to do something. To, you know how it is. 
And so in uh, Genesis chapter 39, verse number one, watch this. Watch what transpires. What, see, see what happens. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt. That's uh, Genesis 39. That's the first book of the Bible, by the way. All right, there you go. Amen. Uh, Genesis chapter 39, verse one. And, and Joseph was brought down to Egypt. So he's in chains. His brothers just stripped his coat. They threw him in a pit. They was about to kill him. And, 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 and uh, then he ends up in chains. They sell him into slavery. He's on his way down to uh, Egypt. And um, someone is calling me on my watch. I can't believe someone is calling me on a, on a, a Sunday. Don't they know we had church? I guess they believe there was no church, whatever. So anyway, I'm at church. They obviously not watching either. <laughs> so Joseph was brought down in chains. I don't know how long it took him to get down to Egypt in chains. He was on a chain gang. I, I don't know how long, but it took him a while. It, it didn't happen in just a couple of hours. He had time to think about what happened. He had time to think about the coat that he didn't have anymore, the brothers that wanted to kill him to put him in the pit, sold him. So he had time to think about all that. What he didn't have is any inkling of an idea. Nothing was given to show that his dream was going to come to pass. To the contrary, everything seemed to indicate that he made it all up. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of, of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, uh, bought him of the hands of the Israelites. And so he paid cash. He paid hard cash for him. Now he's his slave. And here we go. And the Bible says, which had brought, had brought him down thither. So he bought him and brought him. He bought him with money and brought him down to his household. Now, this is it. The only indication that uh, Joseph had that everything was going to be all right was the next verse. And the Lord was with Joseph. Now, here he is. He's in chains. Here he is being sold into slavery. Here he is in this situation away from his father's house. And the only thing he had to show for it was God with him, was Emmanuel. Can I tell you that's the only thing you need? That's the only sign you need that God is still working in your life, that God is still working on your behalf, that everything is going to be all right that everything God has spoken it shall come to pass everything that's stacked up against you it shall come to naught because one day that person that you're serving will one day serve you Potiphar will be bowing before you one day he could not see it it didn't seem like it would happen or it would materialize. He couldn't picture it. He could not imagine that the man that he was enslaved to, that just paid cash money for him, that one day that man would be serving him. The only sign he had, the only thing that he could go by was the very fact that when he was brought down to Potiphar's house, uh, the writer said, I want to let you know that despite everything, God was with him. And so we need to know and we need to understand in our bad times. And I know some of you have had some bad times. I know some of you have some bad times right now. Can you see God beyond your circumstances? Can you see the bigger picture? Can't you see God there working with you? God with you. Sometimes, man, things get rough. And sometimes we wonder, what in the world 
is going on in my life. God, hey, hey, you forgot about how oh, you forgot about me. Hey, here's my address. Hello, God, don't you see what I'm going through? It's been a God, hey, what's going on? And we get like Job. I go forward and I can't behold him. I go backwards and I can't, be, I can't find him. To the right hand where he does work to the left. And hey, God, there's no way. Hey, man, I'm looking for him in my pockets. Uh, and my pockets only have lint. I can't find God anyway in anything. Uh, but God is right there. He said, but he knows the way I should take. And even though I don't, I can't recognize, I need to understand with uh, a, a revelation. And I don't know, I, I don't know what God used to, to, for him to realize God. I don't know how uh, Job concluded and surmised the very fact that even though, hey, I can't see him, I can't feel him, hey, I, it doesn't matter. I can't go by my feelings and I can't go by my sight. I need to go by faith and not by sight. And I don't have to go by my feelings, but by my faith because God is with me. Emmanuel, that's the only, only sign I need. Sometimes, I mean, hey, things get, get rough. I, have you, anybody been there? Am I, am, I, am I in the rough spot all by myself? Hey, man, I, I, I tell you, I, I've had times I'm like, oh, 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 God, what in the world is going on? I, uh, maybe I took a left hand and a turn and you took a right turn and, hey, let's get this thing, let's get on the same page. That's why you need to make sure you're always on the page with the right page with God. You need to make sure, hey, in the mornings and at, in the, during the day and at night, amen, that you're still aligned with God, still ca called according to his purpose. And when God is using things and working things in your life, amen, you need to find a place to repent because God is not repenting. He doesn't have to repent. He He'll, he'll never change. He doesn't have to change. He's perfect. And we need to make sure we are aligned with God because I want to walk with him. I want to go with him. And whatever God is saying and doing, I want to be a part of that. And so whatever God is using in my life, I need to make sure my attitude is not, my thinking is not stinking, as they say. I need to make sure my attitude is right. Amen. I need to make sure my heart is right, that I'm forgiven. And so God was working in Joseph's life, letting him know I am the sovereign God. I I am the supreme Lord, and I can do anything and everything. I want to let you know that everything that's going on that's negative in your life, you just watch and see. It's going to get bad. As a matter of fact, it's going to get worse. And when you think all is lost, and when you think everybody has forgotten you, when you're locked up behind bars and in prisons, and no one is giving you the gratitude and, and the thankfulness that you need, you're going to interpret dreams, and they're still going to forget about you. Hey, you're going to go to the deep was part of the prisons, but I want to let you know that I can answer in a moment. I can step through in the twinkling of an eye. When I come through, I come through. And the only sign you need to know, only sign you need is to understand is that I and with you. And as long as I'm with you, hey, you are going to be okay. And we find he's in the house of Potiphar. Verse number two, and the Lord was with Joseph. And watch this. Verse number two, Genesis 39. And because the Lord was with him and he was a prosperous man. Notice that. And he was in the house of the master of his master, Egyptian. So he's a slave. He's in the house of his master. But because God is with him, he's prospering as a slave. Now, obviously, you can't say, well, he's a rich man. See, let me tell you something. In every circumstance that you work, God can bless you in. I don't care whether you had to sleep on someone's couch. I remember when I first came to God, amen, it, it got so rough in my life because I was a knucklehead, hardhead. Amen. I, 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 uh, um, I pretty much lost everything, uh, and uh, I had the clothes on my back. Barely had that. Had some other clothes, whatever. It was just life was just, just, just in chaos. Amen. And I and, and trying to get my life together, whatever. And I found myself uh, living with somebody, somebody sleeping on their couch, and 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 that's how bad my life got. Amen. But let me tell you, 
God had a plan for my life. And I couldn't see everything. I don't, it doesn't matter what's going on in your life right now, no, the things that will come about. Amen. You have to believe and you have to know that God is with you. And, but we need to understand God is with us in the bad times. So I told this person, I said, look, God is with you even if you don't see, see so for, uh, from a pastor's perspective, a lot of times when I see people come to me and they come to me for counseling and they're going through and everything else and they, they need a word of, uh, of encouragement, I'm looking, I'm like, they don't even see the, the blessing of God in their life. They don't see the hand of God in their life. Sometimes you can look at your circumstance so much that you can't look at God. And so some, sometimes you need to stop looking at your circumstance and look for God because he's right there. He is with you. And so he prospered. It goes on just for time's sake. He became overseer in the man's house. You know the story. He became overseer in the man's house and everything seemed well. And the Bible says Joseph was a goodly man and he was well favored. I mean, when God starts to bless you, guess what? People start noticing I mean, he was a prisoner. I mean, a, a slave. He was a slave. And, and, and everybody's watching. Hey, hey, the, the fellow slaves are looking like, hey, man, why is he got it so good? And I'm going to just tell you what, again, the hand of God and the blessing of God is in your life even during the storms, even during the dark clouds, even during the times that the wind is. But I'm telling you what, God, you should be able to see the, the hand of God even when, you know, think you don't even know how you can pay your bills and, and God is still coming through. Let me tell you, in my worst situations and, and predicaments, I can remember when, when there was more money going out than what was coming in. And I don't know, I can't, with, with the natural mind and, and, and the intellectual mind, I can't to this day comprehend how God got me through those difficult times. But I'm here to testify, amen, when things were just out of whack and, and stacked against me. It wasn't me. It wasn't my wife. Amen. It wasn't, I'm telling you, God was working and God saw me through. Some of you can identify. Some of you can testify. And you worst situations and circumstances, God was still working in your life, and it was him that was getting you through. And so the wife took notice. Now, you got the wife of the big man. Man, something's happening in his life. Sometimes the wrong people take notice of you. You got to be careful. It's so when God starts blessing you, even in the down times, you can have the wrong impression and you can do the wrong thing because God will test you and you don't stop short of anything. You don't, uh, let me say it this way. You can't compromise on a promise God showed you, amen, to try to get something that you shouldn't have. And sometimes people want things they shouldn't have and I don't care how enticing it looks, amen, certain things are off limits. And, and sometimes people want things that God is really not trying to give them. If God didn't give you that in his dream, if God didn't give you that in his vision, when you go along the way and, and, and God is working in your life and you find yourself in certain situations, don't let the devil put something in your way and in your path. Because he will allow compromise to come for you to settle for something that's not part of the promise. Potiphar's his wife wasn't part of the promise. And so, she, you know, you know the story. Amen. And so, he ends up in prison for something he didn't do. I mean, it got really bad. You know, you, you know, it got really rough. Now, I don't know. Uh, the Bible says once he was in prison. Um, I'm going to skip down for time's sake because I know you want to get out of here. And it doesn't seem like I'm even nowhere near uh, the, the, the uh, landing point. You know, somebody's wondering, see, I don't feel a final descent. You know when you're flying and you feel like that, it's the final descent, you're like, thank God. Don't worry, it's, yeah, yeah, we're about to decrease our altitude, folks. Genesis 39 and 
19, and it came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spake unto him, saying, After this man did thy servant to me, that his wrath was kindled. Now, this is the problem. If Joseph did what he, what his wife accused him of, and if Potiphar believed what his wife accused Joseph of, it, they would have had him executed. But he didn't do that. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. And he was there in the prison. Now, now, now you're in the king's prison. And you have to understand, when he was placed in this prison, he had a life sentence. In other words, he was institutionalized. He wasn't getting out, ever. Do you understand that in that predicament, the sentence that he was pronounced with, that he was never going to see the light of day? You're talking about the, the, the brothers bowing before his she's bowing before him and the sun and the moon and the stars and all that. That wasn't happening with this predicament. See, this is what God is painting this picture, that it, it, it got worse. N not only is he not, a, he's not a prisoner, in, I mean, a, a, a slave anymore. Now he's inside of the, the worst place he could be, and there's no chance of him getting out. But here we go again. It says, and he was in the prison. And then verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph. Zachary, you can come. The Lord was with Joseph. I, I, I want to tell you today. That everything that's going on right now, you need to say to yourself, but the Lord is with me. Anything that's going to happen, everything that has happened, you need to remind yourself. Amen. You need to go tell your family. You need to go tell somebody. I, I, you, you know, when you start talking about everything that's going on bad in your life, when you call your parents and say, Pastor, I'm going, you know, just say, but Pastor, the Lord is with me. Hey, what, what, what sign do you have that you're going to get through this? What sign do you have that you're going to be able to pay your bills? What sign do you have that you're going to be able to overcome? What sign do you have that every dream you've gotten, every vision is going to come to pass? What sign do you have? You have this sign, Emmanuel. But God is with me. The Bible says that the keeper of the prison in verse 23 looked not to anything that was under his hand, but because the Lord was with him. And we know as we read on that one day the Pharaoh was given a dream by God Almighty. God orchestrated it. You're talking about things going south. <laughs> Look at Joseph's life. And some of you, you feel like, you know what? How did I get here? I had so, so many ambitions. I, have, I had ideas. I saw myself in a certain place. God showed me what he would have for me, the ministry, the calling, the giftings, the gifts, his purpose in my life. And I, I'm so far from that place in God. Can anyone identify with this story? That you saw a, a better picture. You, you, you saw that you would be in a different scenario. You saw the hand of God that would be in your life, the blessing, the power of God. You saw yourself, you saw yourself in ministry. You saw your personal life, your, your marriage, your family life. You saw your financial life. You, you thought you would be in a different state of being. 
And you can drop your head. You can throw in the cards. You can throw in the towel. You can call it quits and say, God, well, just whatever. And then you can just go through the motions of life, not caring what happens. Well, whatever happens, happens. Now you, you give up on your dream. You can give up on what God really has for you, but just because it doesn't seem that way. It really didn't seem like Joseph was going to get any of those things he dreamed about. Dreamt about. It, it, didn't, it, it appeared that it, it was just the end that he was going to spend his life in prison, overseeing prisoners. But one day, he got a call from the warden. Joseph! And I can imagine him scratch his head, what did I do now? What am I being accused of now? Or who's going to come and give me another dream to interpret? They forgot about me two years ago. I interpreted dreams. I got it right. They still forgot about me. Now what do they want? Potiphar. Hey, you, you got an appointment. You need to get cleaned up. You need to get dressed up, huh? You got to wash. You got to get prepared. You're about to go to the palace. Oh, another palace. First it was Potiphar's wife. Oh, no, not, pa not, not Pharaoh's wife. Come on, go to the palace. Pharaoh had a dream, and he wants you to interpret it. Okay, so I'm going to interpret Pharaoh's dream. I'm going to go right back to the prison like I did before. Okay, I'll do it. Begins to interpret the dream. And then Pharaoh, out of nowhere, says, hey. After, after Joseph says, this is what you need to do, appoint somebody and everything else. Everything is going to be okay. Joseph is putting his head down, turning around, is about to go back to his prison cell. Pharaoh takes his scepter and boom, stomping on the ground. I'm just painting another picture for you. It says, hey, who else is more worthy for this position? But this man himself. And I'm going to make you a ruler over all of my kingdom. That no one will be even more powerful. No one can do anything. And the only time I am even more powerful is when I sit on the throne. And when I'm not on the throne, you are the most powerful man in Egypt. Wow. At one moment, one day, one dream interpreted, and everything changed. I don't know what you have dreamt. I don't know the things God has spoken to you about your life. I don't know the future that God said you would have. I know the collective future for the church. And I'm telling you, the church is not going down. I don't care how bad it gets. I don't care if we're put in the pit. I don't care if we're placed in chains. I don't care if we're being accused or locked in prison. One day, the church is going to fulfill everything that God has promised. And we're going to sit on the throne, reigning and ruling with Christ. And you as an individual, you have an opportunity to hold on to the faith that God has given you. And maybe you don't have anything to look at with your natural eyes. Amen. Maybe there's no signs that has been given that you can say, hey, I'm going to be okay. But the only sign that you have and the only sign, quite frankly, that you and I need it's a sign that God gave. The greatest sign, he said, I want you to search deep as you can search, and I want you to search as high as you can search for the greatest sign, the deepest sign. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, you don't want it, I'm going to do the greatest sign. I'm going to show you the deepest sign. The greatest sign that you and I can have in our life is Emmanuel. God is with us. 
Everywhere we go and everything that we go through, amen, you just need to be reminded that that's the greatest sign you need while we're going through the corona crisis. This is the greatest sign you need. God is with me and everything is going to be all right. Won't you just lift your hands up where you are and won't you just remind yourself, amen, won't you just worship God? Won't you get rid of the complaints that you've had, the doubt and the fear that you had? Hey, you don't need to fear. Just be quiet. Just be still. Don't be faint-hearted. Remember everything God has promised. God is with us. Where's your head? Keep your head with you. I pray right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, let's pray right now in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you, Lord, for being faithful and being true to who you are. We bind every thought. We bind every idea, every premonition. God, we bind anything, every stronghold, everything that would exalt itself above the knowledge of Christ. And Lord, we speak revelation and understanding and illumination upon the mind in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we, we repent, Lord, for our, our complaint, our fear, our doubt, our concern. Lord, we get a hold of the sign that you've given us and that that's the very fact that you're with us. God, we pray right now that we would be the living testimony that you have called us to be in this day, in this hour, in the name of Jesus Christ. God is truly with us. God bless you. Jesus. Trust you, and in your never failing love, you work everything for good. God, whatever comes my way, I will trust you. In the mountain air, sovereign, or the ocean floor, with me in the calm. Sovereign and my greatest joy, sovereign in my deepest cry, with me in the dark, with me at the dawn, in your everlasting arms, all the pieces of my life, from beginning to the I will trust you, and in your never-failing love, you work everything for good. God, whatever comes my way, I will trust you. In your everlasting arms, all the pieces of my life, from beginning to trust you and in your never failing love you work everything for good God whatever comes my way I will trust you in your everlasting arms all the pieces of my life from beginning to the trust 
never-failing love. You work everything for good. God, whatever comes my way, I will trust you. mindful, maybe keep in the forefront of our minds that God is with us. So as we leave out and go on our way this Mother's Day, again I leave this pun with you. Where's your head? Where's your head? 
enjoy your Mother's Day. Amen. Again, as a reminder, we are not streaming this evening. We'll give you an opportunity to uh, do something for Mother's Day. Maybe instead of being in your living room, maybe you'll go down to your basement. <laughs> Maybe go outside. I don't know what the weather's going to be like. So I believe the shelter in place has been lifted. You can go to the beach, right? We don't, you know, you know, I'm just saying, you can go to the park. You can go fishing. You can go camping. You can do all those things that now you can do that you couldn't do. I guess you can go bicycling and all that. Well, a lot of restaurants are open and, open and you can drive, do the drive through or you can have it ordered. And so a lot of now people can just eat at home, get your meal from your favorite restaurant, treat your wife, whomever else, your mother or what have you. Don't let the guys make an excuse. Let them do something. So we hope, we're still gonna hold them accountable, right ladies? Amen. We're still having Mother's Day. But I hope and pray that you enjoy uh, your Mother's Day. God bless you. Again, uh, Thursday at 7 p.m. we'll pick up on our lesson that we're teaching. And you enjoy your week in Jesus' name. <laughs>